and welcome to another edition of Folks. We kick off today's program with an interview with one of Louisiana's most noted authors, Ernest Gaines. He is probably best known for his book, The Autobiography of Miss Jane Pittman. Well, Sonia Massengale caught up with this talented wordsmith in Lafayette. This is the University of Southwestern Louisiana in Lafayette. It is here that distinguished author Ernest Gaines serves as writer in residence in the English department. Ernest Gaines is probably known best for the autobiography of Miss Jane Pittman, which was made into a television movie starring actress Cicely Tyson. But his literary credits include about 10 books still in print in English and several foreign languages. Gaines was born in a little house in Oscar, Louisiana, near the False River some 50 odd years ago. The house was destroyed many years ago, but not the spirit of the people that Gaines left there when he went to make something of himself in the 1940s. They served as his inspiration for the book that made him a living Louisiana legend. I remember as a kid uh, how the people used to come to my aunt's place, my aunt who raised me. She, uh, she's crippled, she never walked. So she could not travel, and the people would always come to our place to talk and talk and talk. And uh, maybe, uh, and she's a very strong person, although she couldn't go about places, she looked after us. She had to crawl all over the floor, but she could uh, cook and wash our clothes and patch our clothes and discipline us too when we needed discipline. And uh, I think uh, in Miss Jane Pittman, uh, uh, the, 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 the spirit, the strength of my art would be in Miss Jane. But of course, Miss Jane did a lot of traveling, so that would not be my art there. So I, I suppose I took things uh, uh, from different uh, people, from uh, from reading about people, from living uh, in Louisiana, being born and raised in Louisiana, and in, uh, in my art as well. But uh, Miss Jane is not based on any uh, uh, one person or, uh, or a combination of uh, a composite of uh, two or three or uh, whatever number of people. What was it like for you seeing your novel come alive on the screen? Well, you know, uh, the writer writes to be read his book is written there to be read. And uh, to see the, uh, the book on screen is uh, an, an added thing. But um, the scenes that they did uh, well, uh, you know, I, I, I like seeing them. There are lots of things that were changed. Uh, but um, it was one of those things. I, a writer, as I said, writes to be read and not for, uh, not for film, really. And yet, uh, he would like that uh, someone would take that kind of interest in his in his uh, in his material in his book, and make a film out of it. It, it helps sell the book, it uh, promotes uh, it promotes the book, and it makes the writer known. You've said that you wrote more effectively about Louisiana when you were in San Francisco. Why is that? Well, usually, uh, most of the things that I write about. Uh, uh, takes place in the past. And uh, if I were to go back to this plantation where I grew up or go back to the area where I, I grew up uh, on, in Pankapee Parish, things have changed so much that if I, if, I, if I was there, I would not see what I wanted to write about. So uh, what I usually, what I can do and what, what I do is uh, to, um, to, you know, lock yourself up in a room and this is how you write. You sit at a table, 
with uh, pencil and paper and uh, uh, stare at this blank paper until you start putting something down on the, on the paper. And you can be almost anywhere to do this. You don't have to. You're not seeing that physical thing out there, but you're imagining how it looks. And this is what, uh, what, uh, what happens. So I can write anywhere. I can write in the, uh, Minnesota or, well, I've, you know, I've been in Minnesota. I don't, I would, I'd rather not write in Minnesota. But uh, I suppose I could write uh, as well any place else as I can in Louisiana, although I have to come to Louisiana to to see things and to feel things, to touch things, to uh, uh, talk to the people, listen to the rhythm of their voices, uh, um, look at the trees, look at the rivers, the bayous. Um, you know, you have to do these kind of things, stay in contact with things. But as far as the actual writing, uh, I can write almost, um, I suppose I can write almost anywhere. When and why did you decide to become a writer? I've, I've been telling people in the past that I decided to become a writer when I, uh, uh, about the age of 16, when I went to California. Well, I went to California at 15, but I decided, I suppose, by the age of 16. But now that I think about it, I must have, uh, I decided to become a writer when I was by the age of 16. But I had been writing, I would say, uh, since the age of uh, seven or eight, because I used to write for the old people on this plantation. Uh, many of these older people uh, had no education at all and they could neither read nor write, so I would write the letters for them and I would read the letters back which they would receive. And uh, so I started writing at that very early age, I suppose at the age of uh, seven or eight, I could uh, write as well as many of them could, the older ones I'm, sp I'm speaking of, because they had very, uh, no education at all. And uh, I could scribble something for them to send out to their sons or their daughters or their kinfolk or whoever they were writing to. Later, I went to California at the age of uh, 15. And uh, at the age of 16, I suppose, I went into a library and I saw all these books all over the place. But when I went to these shelves, there were no books there about blacks. And uh, it was then that I tried to, uh, to write something, tried to put something, uh, tried to put a book up there. I remember when someone asked me, what is, the most, what is the book that influenced you most in your writing career? And I said, well, and I thought and thought and thought. I could not recall the book that influenced me most. And I said, well, maybe the one that influenced me most was the one that was not there. Because when I did not find what I was looking for, it was then that I decided that I really wanted to become a writer and write about the, the people I knew, the kind of people, the, the people I left, the people I came from. Ernest Hemingway and William Faulkner are only two of the many writers who have influenced Gaines' writing, but he draws his inspiration from many other sources. Not only have writers been great influence on my work, but uh, so, uh, so have um, um, musicians. Uh, the great blues singers have had influence. The great uh, uh, jazz men have had influence. Uh, I look at the, the discipline in the, in the athlete who can have influence and see how he must prepare his body, his mind um, um, to, to, to accomplish his, 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 uh, his job, his task. So, uh, and I must do the same thing. I mean, writing is not just uh, boozing and doing all kind of crazy thing and then think you're going to write. You have to get your... You, you know, you think together and then sit down and discipline yourself day in and day out and day in and day out in order to, uh, to accomplish uh, any writing. One of Louisiana's youngest ambassadors is Kenneth Mack Jr. of Natchitoches. He has sung at the White House for President and Mrs. Reagan and in Vatican City for Pope John Paul II, where earlier this year, Kenneth sang for us. Kenneth Mack Jr., to be more precise, and he is a singer. Well, actually, he is more than just a singer. Young Kenneth Mack is a performer. His singing career began when he was just three years old. Kenneth, tell us what singing means to you. Well, when I sing, a lot of times it expresses the way I feel a lot of times. And to me, well, I know it's a God-given talent, and I love it, and I just thank God for it. Do you ever get tired of it? No, sir. Our first encounter with Kenneth's vocal talents was last spring at Louisiana's very special arts festival in Baton Rouge.
oldest of three children, and his parents speak of him with a great deal of pride. Tell me what goes through your mind whenever you hear Kenneth sing. I get chills, you know, every time I sing, and, and, and I get very emotional. I just can't believe that this is my son uh, exemplifying all what I wanted to do my all my life, and I can really just see myself. That's what I see, and that's what it gets so touching, that I just see him doing what I've always wanted to do. Something inside my heart just seemed to swell up real big. Even though he's my son, I feel like if he was anybody else's child, I would feel the same, you know, emotional sensation because I know he really feels what he sings. So uh, I just feel real good. I feel warmth and peace when he sings. The past several months have been busy ones for Kenneth. In November, he went to Rome to sing for Pope John Paul II. I was on it. Yes, sir. And the Pope, him and I spoke to each other and the Cardinal. and. Um, it was real great, and he blessed me. What did you say to the Pope? I told him I was real honored to sing for him and that he had a nice place. It was an exciting experience for the both of us, and I feel like he was really doing something that uh, God had chose him to do, and he was not honoring, you know, uh, the country, you know, representing the country, the United States, but also many others that, you know, really uh, look up to the Pope and uh, speak highly of him. I felt a real honor, and I felt like we were really being blessed by being there, our presence being there, I and mean, it was just, it was just an honor. It was a great honor to be there and to hear my uh, son sing for the Pope. And in December, the Mack family visited the White House where Kenneth sang for President and Mrs. Reagan. What was it like singing for President and Mrs. Reagan? Uh, it was fun. It was real fun. I was honored and, uh, to be on the program with Natalie Cole and Amy Grant to get to really meet them, you know, how they really are. And it was great. It was real great. Did the President or Mrs. Reagan say anything to you? Yes, sir. I had a um, personal, well, my family and I had a personal audience with the um, President and his wife, and we took a lot of pictures, and they gave me a birthday present. The Washington trip, I was there on the, uh, on the set to see it to happen, to see it all get formed up, and uh, now that's when the sensation started. I really started seeing the future that, it, that could uh, come in to play, and uh, I was excited. I was like a rooster, my head up, chest out, very proud, very proud. The publicity resulting from Kenneth's trips has been overwhelmingly great. He has made several appearances on network television and has captured the attention of many newspapers. What kind of effect do you think all the publicity over the past several months is going to have on your son? It's going to have a profound effect, not only, not only for our family, our church family, our community. Everybody's backing him. I mean, it's uncanny how people are support, so supportive of him rather than being envious or whatever. The people are behind him. Uh, and uh, I feel that he's going he's to affect a lot of people, not only this community, yeah. but the nation, maybe the world, hopefully, because it's that kind of energy is behind it. Let me direct this question to the both of you. What are your hopes and dreams for your son? Hopes, dreams, that's great. Uh, <laughs> the sky's the limit. We're hoping that he'll become um, a, an, an aid uh, to help society be, uh, get a realization about God, about family, about country. If he can be that utensil, I think that he served a lot of, lot of good. Ever since I had him, he, he's always been a special child to me, and others have referred to him as being special even before he was enrolled you know, in the program and his uh, talent you know, began to surface. Uh, I always knew that somehow he was going to be used. You know, he was going to do something real great. And I just really uh, appreciate what he's doing now. His singing, it has touched so many people, and it touches me, you know, when he sings. So I feel like from here on out, you know, that the Lord will continue to use him to minister to other people. And uh, so they can feel what he feels when he sings, because when he sings, he wants others to be touched and feel the same way he's feeling at that time. So uh, my dream for him uh, is that, you know, he continue on and that uh, he'll, you know, really be blessed in doing what he's doing. I'm falling head over heels in love with Jesus. I'm falling head over heels in love with him. For he has turned my life around. Once I was lost, 
But now I found I'm falling head over heels in love with him. I'm falling head over heels in love with Jesus. I'm falling head over heels in love with him. For he has turned my life around. Once I was lost, but now I found I'm falling head over heels in love with him. I thought I knew what love was all about, but I had known the love of friends and family. But when I met the one to save me, I found out that this love was love I thought could never be. I'm falling head over heels in love with Jesus. I'm falling head over heels in love with him. For he has turned my life around. Once I was lost, but now I found I'm falling head over heels in love with him. For he has turned my life around. Once I was lost, but now I found I'm falling head over heels in love with him. In April, folks took a look at Louisiana's black colleges. One of the colleges we visited was Dillard University in New Orleans. Now, while there, we had an opportunity to see an original play entitled Contributions. It was written by Ted Shine, a Dillard graduate. we now like to share some of that play with you. Miss Love, Miss Love. Hey, what's the matter? They ain't right out there, is they? Well, then what's the matter? Did you get the sheriff's strong bread? I poked my head in through the door, and he said, what you want, gal? I told him I brought him his breakfast. He says, well, bring it here. His eyes lit up when he looked at your cornbread, didn't they? And then he told me to get him a quart of buttermilk from the icebox. And he started eating your bread and fussing at me. Hurry up, get out for a finish. Well, then what happened? Well, I got his milk. And when I got back to his desk, he was kind of half sitting and half standing, holding that big belly of his and fussing and high him. Give me that milk, gal. Can't you see these ulcers is killing me? Well, he ain't even got no ulcers. <laughs> well, he had some, all right. Because <laughs> them old blue eyes of his was done by what seemed to be like pools of blood. And his face was red as a beat. <laughs> Go on, girl. Well, he was panting and breathing hard. And he drank all that milk in one go. Then he belched. And he told me to get my black behind out of his face. And he told me to tell all the Negroes that this is the be all and the end all day. Indeed. Ooh, child, he flung the plate at me. <laughs> I ran out into the street. The street was full of white folks with sticks and rocks and things, old ones and young ones, even children. <laughs> even my white folks were there. Well, what was they doing? Nothing. They weren't doing nothing, just standing and watching. They look down here towards the drugstore. Then they look back down towards Sheriff Morrison's office. Then old Sheriff Morrison come out of his office, kind of bent over in the middle like, and he belched in his stomach, growled, woo! You can hear it clear across the street. I have seen it before, child. I have seen it before. First was old Doc Fulton, medical man that didn't know his liver from his kidneys. He watched his entire family die. Then he died himself because he was dumb. Calling me to his deathbed to hold his hand, talking about, I ain't got nowhere else to turn, Auntie. I looked over at him, I said, You related to me in some way? He laughed and the pain hit him like an axe. Sang me a spiritual. I said, I don't know no spiritual. He said, Well, sing me something holy. Can't you see him dying? I sang him a song. Then I told him why he was dying. Well, he was a doctor, he didn't know. Shoot. Dr. Fulton, how come you didn't treat my husband? How come you let him die like an animal in the alley? Girl, when I got through opening up his nose to what was going on, he stood up red like the sheriff. And then he fell over, dead. I spat on his body, went downstairs, cooked me a steak, got my belongings and left. Well, you didn't call an undertaker? Shoot, I 
left that old buzzer for the maggots. And they was found him a week later, stick in the heaven. And now the sheriff, Lord, I have nothing but peace of mind and satisfaction. Because I'm like my grandson in my own way. Too old to be beaten wet up. I votes and I does my part. Well, I reckon I better be getting on. You think you ought to stay here by yourself? Oh, go on, girl. Go catch up with the children before they run away from you. Ma'am, those children got eyes, Kate. And they know what's going on. And they ain't gonna be taken too kindly to their mother's attitude for much longer. You was a young woman, Kate. Don't make no sense for you to be a fool all your life. I don't know what you're talking about, Mrs. Love. Well, you'll find out sooner or later. Just hope it's not too late. Thank you for the favor. Yes. Grandma, they served us and didn't us all do a thing. We immigrated. Well, tell me about it. Well, when I got there, every white person in the county was on that street. They had clubs and, and iron pipes, and there was dogs and fire trucks with hoses. Well, anyway, when we reached the drugstore, old man Thomas was standing there in the doorway. What y'all want, he said. Service, someone said. That's when the crowd started yelling and making nasty remarks, but none of us moved an inch. That's when the sheriff came down the street from his office. He didn't cuss none? He swore up and down. He walked up to me and said, Boy, what turn the mother niggas want around here? Freedom, baby, I told him. Freedom my behind, he said. Y'all better get on back where y'all belong and stop acting up, for I sick these dogs on you. We ain't leaving till we've been served, I told him. He looked at me in complete amazement. Then he belched and started foaming at the mouth. He was mad, Grandma. He said he'd die before a nigga said where a white woman's behind had been. God is my witness, he said. May I die before I see this place integrated. Then he took out his whistle. And he put it to his lips. But before he could muster up the breath to blow him, fell to the ground. He rolled himself into a tight ball, cussing and moaning and thrashing around. Then the foaming at the mouth got worse, and he puked, a bloody puke. And his eyes looked like they was going to come out their very sockets. Then he opened his mouth and gasped for breath. Well, in the excitement, some of the boys went on into the store, and the girl at the counter says, Y'all can have anything y'all want. Just don't put a curse on me. <laughs> While black faces feel that color, someone from outside yelled, Sheriff Morrison is dead. How do you know so much? You weren't there. Well, no, I wasn't, but I've seen it. I've seen it before. What? Death in the room. <clears throat> Old Dr. Crawford's entire family went that way. Some easier and quicker than others, depending. Depending on what? How they loved and treated their fellow neighbor. Namely me. Grandma, what's in that bag you're fumbling with? Spice. You're lying to me. What is it? The spice of life, baby. Did you do something to Sheriff Morrison? <laughs> Grandma, what did you do to Sheriff Morrison? I helped y'all integrate in my own way. What did you do to that man? I gave him peace. I sent him to meet his maker in flying colors. Tore out his very guts with my special season. Grave me. Calling me nigga. Beating on my men folk. But why? Because I'm a tired old woman who's been tired. Who ain't never had no place and ain't got no place in this society. You talk about the new Negro? I was a new Negro 76 years ago. Don't you think I wanted to sip on me a nice cold Coca-Cola when I went shopping? Don't you think I wanted to hold a decent job so I could feed and clothe my family properly? I resented being called girl and auntie by folks who wasn't even good as me. I worked for nigger haters, made them love me, put my boy through college and sent him to meet them making flying colors. And I got no regrets, boy. Just peace of mind and satisfaction. And I don't need no psychiatrist. I done vented my pent up emotions. Ain't that what you always say? But you could be sent to the electric chair. Who? Auntie Grace Love. Good old black auntie. <laughs> Shoot. I know white folks, boy. 
and I've been at this for a long time. They know I know my place. Oh, Grandma. Cheer up, son. I've done what I did for you all. And if you don't appreciate it, why don't you ask some of those other young colored boys out there who ain't never been to college and who felt old man Morrison's whip upside their head? They'd appreciate it. Literation. The Underground Railroad. Harry Tubman, that's me. Except I ain't going down in history. Now you take off them clothes before you get them wrinkled up. Where are you going? To shed a tear for the deceased and to get me a train ticket. You going home to daddy? Your daddy don't need me. He's got your mother. No, I ain't going home to your dad. Then where you going? Wasn't you the one telling me about them? Them college students sitting here in Mississippi. But they weren't making much leeway because of the sheriff? Or even the governor? Well, I think I'm going to take a trip on down to Mississippi and see what's happening. You wouldn't by any chance know the governor's name, would you? What? I think he may be needing a good cook right now. Grandma! Now you take off the clothes. And while I'm downtown, I'm going to have me a nice, ice cold Sunday soda at Mr. Thomas's. Well, Lord, ain't much left. I wonder who'll be next. Maybe I should put an ad in the newspaper. Who knows? Where he leads me, I shall follow. Where he leads me, I Well, that's our program for this week. Thanks for watching. We hope you can join us again next week for another edition of Folks. We'll see you. Bye-bye. Mm-hmm.